everyone. I am that Williams guy here for First Person Safety, and joining me today is Brian Hill of the Complete Combatant, now based in Dahlonega, Georgia. Good afternoon, Brian. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, sir? It's good to be I, here. I am doing well. I'm enjoying this new concept in my life called being off. Don't know what to do, do you? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> found more work. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was uh, chatting with the magnificent Steve earlier today, and I'm like, I, I'm trying to come up with a way not to completely waste a three day weekend, and I know I'm going to fail. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Brian, uh, introduce yourself to the audience and tell them a little bit about yourself. Uh, I've been a lifelong teacher in the private sector. Uh, I've taught martial arts most of my life. I'm a firearms instructor, a range master certified master level instructor, uh, brief stint in law enforcement work. And uh, I do this as a full-time job. This is all I do as, as a living now. We have our own range in Dahlonega and I'm traveling and teaching and we host some of the best trainers in the country, like Lee Weems. Well, thank you there, sir. <laughs> uh, for those unfamiliar, Dahlonega is in the very North Georgia mountains. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's about an hour northeast of Atlanta. Yeah. So beautiful place. It's a great place. If you want to get away with your family for a weekend, and if your family doesn't want to go to a class, there's lots for them to do in Dahlonega, Georgia, while you're at a class. We'll definitely know if you're a native of Georgia, though, whether you can say the name right or not. That, that, is, that is true. <laughs> Dolanica? No. <laughs> Uh, and Dahlonega is actually a mispronunciation, but uh, yeah. there you go. That's that's the white man pronunciation. <laughs> All right. Um, tell everybody about your martial arts background real quick. Uh, I started training in martial arts in 1978, which is a long time ago. So I've seen every decade of change in martial arts uh, from what we, we look at now as the you know, the Bruce Lee era where I was doing Wing Chun and Kimpo to the American karate era to uh, Japanese karate and jiu-jitsu to the UFC area area where we all jumped into Brazilian jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai and wrestling. And then I became a full-time mixed martial arts coach. And I not only fought myself, but I trained a lot of other people to be fighters in that. So I've had about every variation of it. I hold about five different teaching degrees in martial arts. And that's black belts of third degree and above, which usually takes quite a bit of time to get. So it's it's been an interesting uh, journey for me. And it's something that, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't have the best childhood. So I went out and found some structure for myself and applied that and gave myself purpose and direction. And it gave me some place to put all that chaotic energy. Yeah, my structure was going out into the pasture and picking up rocks. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. I'm, the, the area of the county that I grew up in was referred to as Rockville, and and the people uh, had an old saying that if you pick up a rock one day, three more will grow overnight, take its place. And my job was to make sure that the pasture was free of rocks, so that when my father cut it, that none of his precious uh, rotary cutter blades would strike a rock. Well, it's the southern version of Kwa Jing King, right? Snatch this pebble from the field. <laughs> yes. And when I kept our pasture clear enough, he hired me out to other people to, to clean up theirs. <laughs> so I haven't busted a lot of rocks, but I picked up a lot of them. All right. So in martial arts, how important is building the proper form from the very beginning of training? Uh, you know, it, it's the reason that you seek out instruction from the beginning. If you can get somebody who is an expert in the style of uh, whether striking or grappling, whichever variation you get involved with, uh, it prevents you from making a lot of mistakes. So the instructor can help you from making critical mistakes, which saves you a tremendous amount of time. But more importantly, they also can show you the proper way, model it for you, allow you to work with other people in a group that are also modeling the same behavior. And then apply a set criteria to see that your performance is improving over time, uh, you know, through belt systems, testing, uh, you know, working pads, working bags, uh, basic techniques. So it's, it's incredibly important because it uh, short quotes the process, you know, with my, my instructors in the last decade, they get four, four decades of me training and being able to show them the mistakes that I made or the more importantly, we get caught up in the details sometimes of things that don't simply don't really matter to, to combative arts. You know, you can get out in the weeds and the details. And I teach them how to not only do the technique properly, but how to be healthy with it. You know, how to, how to think about it, how to manage their, uh, 
their emotions, their, their mindset with it, and uh, how to learn quicker, which is the whole process of having an instructor. And then also to make sure that somebody verifies that they are actually doing something instead of just kind of following a behavior that it has some real purpose to it and that it works for them. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, I don't know how long, how old martial arts really is, but, you know, we go all the way back to the Roman Olympics and there was martial technique. Gladiators were learning techniques warriors always have. And this is an age old honored system of, of a, a kind of apprenticeship under an instructor and learning how to get better at things. So does the proper form of a technique play into the effectiveness of the technique? It certainly does because, you know, we found that while there is some subtle variations with things, there's pretty much one way that the body moves really well. And if we can connect the body in the proper movement, uh, then things become not only efficient, but they become much more effortless and they're a you're able to do them effectively. Now, if you think about the 70s in martial arts, we had some crazy stuff going on because it was really personality over principle. Uh, people's opinions formed what they thought would be the proper martial art. And then they would train other people because that worked for them. That doesn't mean it works for everybody. And what's really happened in the last 40 years is we've applied modern coaching methodologies to it, such as, you know, not only training one person one way, but making sure that we train a large group well and that we videotape them and that we give them feedback, uh, that we apply the proper techniques to it. And it would have some sort of experimentation, you know, which sparring, rolling, things like that, give us real feedback in real time. You know, if you roll in jujitsu and you get tapped out, we call it, you know, it's, it's like you've been, you, you got to die and come back each time. You get a real practice of this and you do it against a resisting opponent. And one thing that has really been a problem for martial arts is if they get too much, uh, they don't use the technique and verify it against a resisting opponent or in an environment that has some chaos to it because they have to learn how to do it under pressure, which is really important. So well, that's that's a big difference between the martial arts world and the firearms world, then, because, you know, other than a force on force class, there's really no way to train firearms under oh, with active resistance or under yeah. that pressure other than, say, competitive pressure. Mm -hmm. And there's no penalty mostly, uh, you know, we have an immediate penalty. So one thing that we always hear in, in firearms is slow down and get your hits. Now, can you imagine a boxing coach telling you to slow down and get your jab in? <laughs> <laughs> you know, instantaneously, you would be like, well, that doesn't really work. So, uh, you know, I just went to Ronnie Dodd's place and I shot the Roger system, which has an immediate penalty if you miss, you know, the target disappears. Um, the problem with a lot of things that we do is we don't have an immediate result to it. And we don't have it against somebody else that's actively re resisting without force on force training. But we both know how hard it is to ha have real quality force on force training. You know, it's a very unique skill sets. And that's what martial arts is really basically force on force training all the time. Yeah, unfortunately, more, most of the force on force training that I see out there quickly devolves into tactical grab assery. Mm -hmm. And um because it, as people they want they want to play the well i'm going to win i can do what i can do to get this and while i guess there's some value to that there's also very much value into following a script for the role players so that the learning objective is achieved for the student uh carl wren our mutual friend uh, out of uh austin texas area uh, kr training uh excellent excellent force on force training for anyone out there that's looking for an opportunity uh, to go to quality force on force training and brian hill who happens to be sitting right in front of you right now uh offers very good force on force training yeah i'm going to carl's place in a couple weeks to offer that very thing well, there so you, go. you know even even as good as he is he's bringing somebody else to uh come in and teach a little bit with that and you know uh that's one thing that's uh, you know claude warner and i talked about it quite a bit the problem with training people to do force on force is that the role players become the world's best muggers. They become assassins. You know, they come so good at their job that nobody can win. And, uh, you know, if we look at actual videos and read actual reports of what's going on, a lot of these things are more simple than the complex force on force scenarios we see. And that was something we were lacking in martial arts early is we just didn't know how fights started or how they set up. Uh, what happened before them so that you know you really have a true true advantage now if you can start applying some of this information to your training 
early because you know what we thought was important just wasn't nearly as important in, in, as some of the things were so right um i want to shift gears to firearms here a little bit i know that you are one of several people that scott jedlinski of the modern samurai product project endorsed as red dot instructors so taking the what you said about the forms and learning the proper forms of martial arts how important is it to learn the proper forms with firearms so that your technique can evolve it's really important you know uh, with the red dot we've had a change in the way that we're looking at the the system itself so we've gone from you know looking at a front sight to back to looking at the target itself but the presentation of the firearm is slightly different because the way that we're using our eyes uh, you know, I found it's really easy for people who have done a lot of martial arts to get used to the red dot because that's the way we see a fight. Um, so Scott also is a, a jujitsu guy and he spends a lot of time on body mechanics and building the draw. And, you know, he's very careful to stay in the performance lane of this is how you perform with this and just be able to use the red dot. Um, and it, it makes a world of difference because. Uh, even as good a coach as, as I am myself in doing this, having somebody else that has already experimented with it and can show me the shortcuts to get better at this quicker. And the other thing is, you and I have been shooting iron sights for a long time. So how deeply ingrained are certain things? You know, that myelination of that technique is very difficult to overcome. And it, it takes a real mindful process that we can believe in to be able to access the full development of the red dot by changing a little bit of what we're doing but you're talking about decades of experience of movement or looking at a front sight and that that is important you know and uh, i had to work very hard on my presentation with the red dot to be able to use it at high speed because it did not come simply to me because I, you know with the iron sights we can guide it in with the front sight a little bit more and correct as we go um, Whereas the red dot, we have to simply use the kinesthetic index of our body, and then the sight should appear from us with a proper draw, draw which has made me a much better at my first draw anyway. Uh, my technique has improved because now I expect to see the red dot. So I'm chaining a decisional process. You know, we say mindset in martial arts, we say mindset in the tactical world. And what it means is a series of associations or expectations. So if, I, if my draw is perfect technically, and I expect to see the red dot, then when I see it, I can confirm it. If I don't see it, I make a correction based on where is it most likely to be. And that allows me to be able to do it quick. Not a simple process. And I think it's harder for people that have a lot of experience at the beginning. All right, Brian, we're getting some sort of noise in the background there, something with your mic and your camera's moving around a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of windy out here. Yeah. Um, I'm struggling with exactly what you just talked about. Yeah. Um, I'm 22 years into this professionally carrying a gun thing and I have worked a lot on my presentation and a lot of skills you mentioned the Rogers system I've got an advanced certificate yeah. from from Rogers uh, you and I both trained with Gabe White and yeah. you know Gabe's very big on teaching the visual accommodation yeah and when I first started experimenting I you know my very first formal training with the red dot was I bought it. I went out, qualified it, zeroed it, and then went to your class because I didn't want to start down a path and have to try to learn something different. So that day, I think standing on your range, I realized that I was actually doing the visual accommodation that Gabe talked about, and I never realized I was doing it or that I was successfully doing it anyway. And then all of a sudden, here's this thing's changed, and I'm supposed to be looking at something different. Oh, I, I'm noticing that everything's clear in front then all of a sudden everything moved to this far in front of me but then I need to be back out here in front again I'm having to make my vision switch back and forth and so now I'm at that point to where when I consciously think about it before I draw the pistol I need to do you know up higher on my presentation and then out the dot arrives exactly where I expect it to be when I'm running on autopilot the dot's not exactly where I expect for it to be. And that's the struggle that I'm going to. So let's take that back to the very first part of the conversation. If the instructor is making sure that the student is doing the forms properly, that's not going to be an issue. Yeah, that's what the role of a good coach and instructor is. 
And I, I see a lot of the guys out there in the business and I'm, I'm, I'm folks, I'm not trying to point fingers at anybody, but they make excuses and they'll, they'll say, well, you know, I, I'm only teaching the basic safety classes. Or I only teach basic classes or new. Those are the most important. Because what you learn first is what you learn best. Uh, what, what thoughts do you have on that, that train of thought? You know, I. Uh, the best indicator for instructors too is how quickly can your students access the information that you're giving them. If you're on the right path and you're teaching them something that's based in principle, it is an available change that comes very quickly, especially for newer students. Students, And then the more you do that with a greater group of people, the quicker you can shortcut the, the process of getting people ready for that. But it takes a big experience base for the instructors to do that. So, you know, one thing in instructor and that we always have to do is we never cease to learn. We have to constantly do that and we have to keep progressing. And our preferences and our likes don't play a big role in this because our students' uh, performance are the most important thing that we have in front of us. And since we teach a lot, you and I constantly see if we're improving somebody or not. If we don't and we follow a methodology where everybody was either staying the same or getting worse, we'd have to change ourselves. And uh, the the excuse factory uh, is like a very ancient martial art that nobody understands anymore. And they just say, well, they've always done it this way and we'll always do it that way. And that ab absolves you of any responsibility for, for teaching people, you know, and if I say, Hey, listen, it's going to take you 10,000 hours to get this. That's not really what that research indicated. What we have to do is get you to understand the concept, get you to practice it. And then move you through the stages of competency, you know, where you go from unconscious incompetence to unconscious competency. And you can do it very, very quickly with people if, if it becomes their, uh, if they have a good reason why. And they understand the mechanics behind it, especially for Americans. We love to know how things work. And that's incredibly important uh, instead of just saying, do it this way or we've always done it this way. So. Yeah, you know, coming through from the law enforcement side before finding the open enrollment world. Yeah, I want to say that necessarily, I'm not going to buy into this whole notion that cops in general are bad shooters because that's just not the case. Uh, while they're not as good technically as competitive shooters, I'll take a room full of cops over a room full of average gun owners any mm -hmm. day because uh, cops have worked in that environment of managing chaos around them, still having to make decisions. But where I think one of the things that this negative and does short circuit the higher end for cops um, and for some extent some private citizens is the standards that we're held to. You know, I was told that the qualification was the standard. And OK, we know from a competitive background that drawing and firing two shots to center mass in three seconds is not that difficult of a standard. But if you think that is the ultimate standard, yeah, I found ways to do that without a lot of actual personal coaching. And I worked hard on those and ingraining those. And then when I found the competitive world and realized there was a whole different level of good out there, then I had to go back and start kind of coaching myself and changing things. And then, you know, as I began to involve more and become in contact more with some of the really true great instructors in the world, I really had to work back and go through and change a lot of things. And then now I've thrown red dot into the mix. And so again, I just, it's just this whole thing, we have to be starting people out correctly from the start. There is no excuse for, well, I'm only just teaching basic classes. You know, and a lot of people don't want to teach the basic class. I still teach basic classes because it keeps me connected to what it's like to be a first time person showing up. And therefore my methodology is available to the beginner as much as it is to the advanced or the intermediate person. And, um, you know, it, it, it used to happen in martial arts where, you know, you get a couple years down the road and then you don't, you teach the white belts, but uh, I had a really good instructor that said, no, the white belts are the most important ones. So we have to have the best instructors with them first, you know, and then the other people can run drills or help people roll or whatever. But the best instructors out there so that they're exposed to it now occasionally and you guys you and i both know instructors like this they're so advanced that they don't even speak the same language as a white belt anymore right you know 
and they can get lost, but it's very important that somebody's overseeing that and making sure that they, they're constantly evolving and that they, the beginners get the best lesson. I think it's an incredibly uh, deep responsibility for us as, as, as teachers to, to embrace the newest person coming in and help them uh, not only do the physical aspects, but understand the responsibility of it and how to manage themselves and how to do this safely and efficiently and hit the target. Yeah, I think part of the issue is that, you know, instructors that are starting out, they see the big names like Givens and Spalding and, and the people of that generation and that level traveling around the country. And they look and say, well, I want to be that guy. And so they start trying to look how to get to there instead of concentrating on the students that they have available. Because, you, look, you got to understand, it would not be economical economical for Tom Givens to come teach a four-hour basic class mm -hmm. somewhere okay that's not what he can do be economically feasible but what he needs is a feeder system of you know I think Tiffany and Akil Tiffany Johnson and Akil Kadir of Citizen Safety Academy in Murfreesboro Tennessee they kind of coined the phrase gateway instructor okay there is a that is the biggest need in the training world is people that are willing to take those basic level new students, train them competently from the outset and to have them prepared for when the big name comes through town to come take a class so that they can actually absorb the material that they're getting in one of those two day, two day deep dive classes rather than just being overwhelmed in the first hour. Yeah, I think too for the instructors, it's it's not just being able to teach the the firearms techniques, but they need to be good teachers. And we, we live in the world where there's an endless amount of great information on how to teach everyone and how to relate to everyone, how to do a good job. You know, Craig Douglas always talks about managing unknown contacts, and I call it managing unknown clients because from the moment I meet somebody, I'm learning how to relate and communicate with them, and it's really up to me to adjust my message so that they can understand it and to meet them on the terms where it's important. And, you know, like I have a young man coming to help me teach next weekend and he's here to apprentice. He wants an apprenticeship. He wants to watch me run the range. He wants to learn how to teach better. So he took the initiative to ask, can I come and help teach? He's not getting paid for it. He wants to come and watch, you know, and therefore now we have a good relationship. We have a mentor relationship and he learns how to teach better because he's a competent shooter but he hasn't done a lot of teaching. So it's a very good system to do that, that, you know, is the higher instructors, they need to reach out to the other instructors uh -huh. and help them learn. And then the other people help them feed into the system. And then we get a real good product at the end of it. Yeah. It's, it's one thing to know how to do it. It's another thing to be able to relate that material and, and to coach yep. it. Yep. And especially, you know, when you move from the working with the individual student to working with the groups of people, those classes can be so diverse and skill level. Uh, you have someone that bought a holster the day before the class, mm -hmm. you know, compared to someone who may have been there, this is their 17th training class. Uh, and they're coming to see what gold nugget can they get from this guy or, or this, this lady. And, you know, you might have both of those people in the same class. And it does take a certain experience level to be able to, uh, relate to both of those people at the same time and everything in between and sometimes an instructor may have to scale the material in a class because when you look around and you say okay I've got three in this class that just can't handle what I was going to do next mm -hmm. and either I have to ask them to sit this out or I have to do something they can accomplish but the, you also have to come up with a way of challenging those people who are ready and that that can be hard to kind of reassess that that on the line you know that's a that's a depth of experience uh you know in coaching we call it managing arousal level um there's a real fine line for people where they learn at some people need to be about four percent over their skill level so that they have enough struggle so that they learn but if you take them past that then they're lost but then you get some hard chargers that really want to go they need about 20 percent you know and you, part of your job as the instructor is not just the technical clearinghouse, but understanding who you're working with and managing them so that they can keep learning and they don't get overwhelmed or underwhelmed and lose the process in it. Because 
it's really weird in this, you know, and you, you get one chance with firearms usually in a couple hours to make an impact, you know, whereas a martial arts instructor, you know, our retention was not wonderful, but once people stuck after the first month, then we usually had a lot of time to it. But you think, you know, three classes a week for a month, I get 12 hours, right. which is a pretty good amount of time to impact somebody and get a, get a handle on it where you may only have three or four hours and uh, you've got to really help them understand the process of learning and how that they can improve, you know? Well, thank you for making that comment. Cause that just, yeah. just brought something to mind. The people that are walking into a martial arts, can I say Jim? I don't, I, I think Dojo is yeah, the correct term, but I'll just say Jim. Yeah. yeah. Some people who are walking into a martial arts gym to study martial arts, they're already motivated. Mm -hmm. because they're coming because they are attracted to wanting to learn that art whereas you, you may see a lot of people in a firearms class because their state mandates mm -hmm. that they have to have this class in order to carry a firearm yeah and they show up either they don't want to be there or i learned everything i needed in the army or uncle jim fought in world war ii and he taught me how to shoot a firearm and you know I had a grandfather and a bonus grandfather who both served in World War II. Uh, one of them was a rifleman, one of them was an airplane mechanic. Uh, which one am I going to ask you know, to learn how to run a rifle? All right. Um, you know, there, there's that different level of why people may be in the firearms class. Are they only there because they have to versus everybody in the martial arts class is there because they want to be there? You know, especially for the armed citizen, a lot of time they show up because they've had a had an event mm -hmm. uh, that has scared them, you know, and they feel unsure about themselves. Uh, so, that you know, that they go to martial arts or they take pepper spray class or take firearms class. And that person is the the gateway instructor into the realm of personal protection. And, uh, you know, that's a lot to manage because psychologically they're pretty nervous and they may have some trauma to deal with. That's why they're there. And they want to get better at it. And what, you know, what I found is that whether I'm teaching martial arts or I'm teaching shooting or whatever I'm teaching, it's an empowerment for somebody to build confidence and to understand their environment and to take responsibility for themselves. So God, what a responsibility that is sometimes when I'm working with someone to recognize those things and to have just, you know, you have just a couple chances where people are open to you to make a difference with them. And as an instructor, you have to learn how to reach out and you have to assess them and make a connection with them and not knife hand them or yell at them or, you know, take them off the line, but understand what works best with them, whatever it is. And that that's a lot of experience. That's the hard part to, to get. You know, how do you teach somebody to do that? They have to teach under somebody who's good at it. And that may be the time where, you know, the firearms instructor, if you're solely a firearms person, where you may have to need to have a very polite talk with the person that you know, there are other options for personal defense other than firearms, and they may be more suited to your lifestyle. And you may have to, to actually refer a client to somewhere else other than to you. Now, that's not your case because you've got the martial arts background and all the other stuff. Um, but that's where you have to be true to the client and true to their needs. You know, our mutual friend, Karen Whitlock, said something excellent in a, in a recent interview I did with her, you know, is the instructor meeting the student's needs or are they just going through their curriculum? And that's, all right, folks, think about the world that the student's living in. If they work in a job setting where they're not allowed to have a firearm at work, but they've had a traumatic event that has prompted them to get interested in learning how to protect themselves, while we applaud them for wanting to learn how to protect themselves and to we want to help them learn how to use the firearm, but we need to be sending them somewhere where they can actually carry something that's going to be 100% relevant to them. And the firearm's just not that. You know, I've looked at it as success when somebody's come to me after class, sometimes like an introductory pistol class, and they say, you know, I don't think this is for me. And the first thing I say, that's, I, I say, well, if that's the way you feel, I totally agree with you. So what can we do for you? What can we figure out for you that's going to make, fill this need? Because you shouldn't be carrying a gun unless you really feel like you're, you're ready to do that. And it's not for everybody. Um, and, you know, there are options out there. This is one of the greatest times in personal protection to really get good options. There's really a significant amount of options. And, you know, 
like your excellent class on stand your ground and whatnot is, you know, you're teaching people a legal precedent of how they use force and how they interact with somebody else. And uh, when I first started, man, it was a mystery. You know, we didn't understand any of it, you know, and even in law enforcement, it, you know, we were doing certain things, but it wasn't this, this, this depth, you know, my first class was with Masada Yub in the eighties, you know, and that was, and I read everything and I followed everything, but I never applied it to martial arts. And, you know, it, it didn't strike me until much later in my life that everything I was teaching was lethal force, you know, yeah. rendering somebody uncom uh, unconscious by choking them or striking them, breaking their joints, you know, it's all grave bodily injury, you know? So I didn't really have a non-lethal application in my hands, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, and the world has changed. Everything's recorded yep. now. And that's, yep. that's very good in a lot of standpoints. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing, it, it clears people of a lot of false allegations. Um, but at the other time, I don't think I can get away with things like hiring someone, a lawyer from the scene. <laughs> you know? I have done that. I've called lawyer friends and say, uh, you need to get over here. There's somebody that needs you. Right <laughs> <now."> <laughs> you know, and that, that, that kind of thing is kind of going to go by the wayside. Yeah. And, um, but you know, this is the world we live in. Uh, you're media department Shelly uh, mentioned that you wanted to talk about the importance of being well-rounded so before we get off I want to throw the floor to you to just to talk about that topic so we know that personal protection it starts at, at the ability to see danger and ends at a, the legal aftermath if you have to use force so that's a lot of, that's a big spectrum of events and having some different types of training from a proactive mindset uh, to a medical class to understanding some sort of pepper spray or some less than lethal force, uh, to have some basic skills that would allow you to escape from a basic position or, you know, because for the armed citizen, our job is very simple to get home safely, or if we're at home and something happens to get away safe, you know, uh, we don't have a lot outside of that. So the skills are pretty easy to work on. Um, you know, Sh Shelly came up with image-based decisional drills, which is, kind of like a field training course for the armed citizen. You know, this is what danger looks like. What will your responses be? And it allows you to get ahead of the pre-need decision-making so that you know what you're going to do in these situations, because there's always an expectation that we will simply react. And that's not the way the world works. Whatever you've programmed yourself to do beforehand and whatever decisions are available to you, those are the ones that you'll go to. And as our, 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 our dear friend, William April said, um, you know, the world isn't as it, it, as you are, it is as it is. And you have to be ready for these things. So understanding your lifestyle and what may be a complication for you, whether it's work environment, getting back and forth from home, shopping, things like that, and understanding what you need to navigate that successfully. And we're not talking about a paranoid lifestyle. We're talking about a balanced way to interact in the, in the world and to understand how to do it. And that may be a little bit of martial arts, maybe pepper spray, it may be a proactive mindset. I think everybody should do a medical course. You know, it's the safest, easiest thing in the world. And you're, you're most likely to save yourself or somebody you love with that. And then understanding the laws that we work under, uh, you know, you're one of the few people that, I mean, who do we refer to for use of force, you know, for the armed citizen? There's not a whole lot. You know, so I think it's under, it's important that we balance all of this out, but we all have our specialty and we like to do that thing, you know, uh -huh. uh, you know, rolling jujitsu is fun, striking is fun, shooting guns is fun, right. you know, but selling a medical class or a, a, a mindset class or a legal class, it's much harder because people just don't recognize the need for it. And you have to constantly be asking your questions to yourself. What will I do in this situation? Is it permissible? Can I do this? Am I capable of these actions? You mentioned something at the very beginning of that, you know, seeing the threat. Yeah. Yeah. I used to work on, in a college campus environment and which, you know, in the state you and I live in prior to, I think, 2018, it was illegal to have a firearm on the, on the school, what was called the school safety zone. Uh, couldn't have a blade that was longer than two inches. There was all sorts of other restrictions that were in place. And I would tell people, go out, there's a local uh, police supply shop in town. And I was constantly sending people there to buy a steel flashlight, mm -hmm. like one of the surefires that had the bevel, you know, on the front. So go out there, tell them I sent you, they'll know exactly what to show you and sell you. <laughs> you know, because 
It's a flashlight. It's always a flashlight. No matter what else happens, it's a flashlight. Now, the fact that it's made out of steel and you can hit somebody with it. Well, I'm sorry. I had this flashlight in my hands walking to my car. And this guy came out of the shadows. And well, I hit him with my flashlight. Hmm. Yeah. One, it would help you see the threat. It would deter the threat. And then if the threat closed in on you, it gave you some sort of a tool to use to deal with the threat. And it was legal. There were no legal problems with that. I just flew back from New Hampshire. I was assisting Scott Jelinski at SIG. And I mean, I had a flashlight in my pocket on the plane and I carried everywhere. And it's an impact device, but it's also an ability to throw my attention into my awareness and allow other people to know that I'm, I'm aware of what's going on around me. It's a very useful thing. And it, it takes a little bit of training to understand it because you're not doing, you know, room clearing or searching, but there is a defensive use for the flashlight that's just excellent. And, uh, you know, how many times do we do have to look at something that's you can't see very well and you need a light? So it's got a multitude of uses. And, you know, for personal protection, these little shortcuts are just fantastic things. And that's what a teacher should be able to at least if they can't do it, they should point somebody that can get them on the right track with that. There you go. Um, Brian, tell everybody where they can find you and what classes you've got coming up. And I know you mentioned uh, the image-based decisions. Uh, plug that yeah. again really quick because I know that's traveling all over the country. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, the image-based decisional drills are flashcards and you get a whole packet of, you get a phone and a flashlight, and, uh, you know, how to use a tourniquet. You get to make the decisions under duress, which is interesting because the every training thing that you start, you believe it's going to yield a certain results. But what we found in this is that we're able to identify to alter perceptions constantly during this, this activity. So we're seeing people with time dilation. Uh, we'll ha- we're having inversion of colors when they look at the pictures, all the things that we see constantly, but it's not so out of control like force on forces that I can actually show them and say, what did you see? You know, and it's if people's perceptions of reality are really distorted under stress. So it's an incredibly useful thing for that. Um, you know, it's one of the hardest things in law enforcement. You know, uh-huh. how many rounds do you fire? I don't know. You know, counting yeah. is hard, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, what color were his pants? What well, could be the same color as a wall? You just you have all these things going on. So image based decisional drills has been really useful for that. And it's one of the few things that gives a total spectrum of forces. Now, if you want to find out more about it, it's at thecompletecombatant.com because my wife is brilliant at this. She's the indispensable organizational wizard. Everything's on our website at The Complete Combatant. And then we do all the social media. We have Instagram. We have Facebook. And we keep up with that. We have a big YouTube channel. Claude told me the other day I have over a thousand videos on my YouTube channel. And all of that's for free. And it's just things that we're talking about. And you'll see... uh, other instructors that I believe in because I'm a perpetual student, just like Lee is. We're always training and we train with each other and we share ideas and we bounce things off each other. And it doesn't mean we always agree a hundred percent with each other, but we're constantly sharpening each other and working on getting better at it. So you should do the same thing too. Boy, that was an infomercial, wasn't it? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Shelly's rubbing off on you, man. You're paying attention. <laughs> All right. What are um, now you what's that? <laughs> order now and you'll get two there you go there you go uh what classes you got coming up uh next weekend i have a sold out rifle class uh so that's fantastic i go to carl wren's place in texas where i am teaching image-based decisional drills and a, uh, a force readiness class on the friday uh i think i'm off to arkansas uh we've got tom gibbons coming here we're hosting him uh so the schedule's on there uh there's so much going on i can hardly keep up with it uh i just look at shelly and she says you're going here and off i go and go teach right so it's a great life though you know i'm very grateful to be able to do this and you were a big factor in that you've been very helpful to me and i'm very grateful to you for your your counsel above all so well, thank, thank you. you well thank you very much for the kind words and yep. uh uh, thank you for allowing me to play along with what you've got going on up there and for, yep. and for coming on, on today. Um, folks, uh, I would just like to say here that I've been very appreciative of the positive feedback I've been getting uh, from these interviews. This was not something that was planned. It was just kind of something that started by accident and has continued to roll. 
Uh, and I'm trying to create a set of resources that are available for people that are seeking to become better as instructors or to become instructors, as well as other related topics. And so I realize this is kind of deep dive stuff. And from hearing, you know, the feedback from people that I value, I, I really very much like that. It would help that if you would be sharing the links, because I can only do so much of that on Facebook. So if you're liking the content, uh, please share the links and, and groups that you go into and, and, and social media, et cetera, to help kind of grow the channel and keep it going. I don't know how fast these things grow. Uh, I do know that over the YouTube analytics that we grew 783% more than we did the first 28 days and the last 28. So uh, it's not John Correa by any means, uh, <laughs> and nor do I want it to be. Uh, I don't need a staff of three people managing my YouTube page. Um, uh, more power to him. Uh, yep. uh, that was the American dream right there, buddy. But uh, thanks for everybody that's been uh, a part of the show so far. And it's not really a show. It's just me sitting in my kitchen and uh, <laughs> on this YouTube thing. My familiar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian doesn't even have a kitchen. He lives in a, in a shed. So it's a... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so thank you for everyone that's been watching and playing along and uh, I'm Matt Weems guy for first person safety